could grab your Bible, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We continue our series through the book of Ephesians. We're calling Basic Christianity. In Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, we see how the gospel impacts marriage. Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 22. Hear now the word of the true and living God. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the Lord, excuse me, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Let's pray. Father God, we want our marriages to reflect the glorious relationship that exists between Christ and his church. Help us to see this morning how we might image uh, that heavenly relationship here on earth. Help us to see how the gospel relates to our marriage as we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we uh, discussed verses 15 through 21, which was about how we as Christians are to live wisely, but also there it describes the Spirit-filled life. And there are a number of ways in which the Spirit-filled life manifests. Uh, verse 19, it shows up in how we address or speak to one another. And we talked about singing, making melody to the Lord with our heart. Uh, how that is typically applied to our worship services, but we also saw that, well, if this is part of the Spirit-filled life, then it has impact and application beyond what we do on Sunday mornings. And then verse 20, we saw that there's an attitude of gratitude that goes along with the Spirit-filled life. We give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. And then Paul concluded here in verse 21, mentioning submission, a, a, a submission one to another. And in fact, uh, the way that this word is used here uh, speaks to uh, the fact that there are ways in which we are to submit one to another, that there is a proper order even to that, just based on the way that word is used. It's unfortunate that that 21st verse has been hijacked, pressed into service to say more than it should. There are those who advocate that since verse 21 says submitting to one another, and this is a demonstration of the Spirit-filled life, that since you have this mutual submission one to another within the church, then somehow that bleeds into the marriage relationship. And really it ought to be that wives submit to their husbands, but also husbands need to submit to their wives. It is very, very interesting that those who argue this way stop there when it comes to mutual submission. In other words, I don't hear the same argument being made for parents and children, nor do I hear it being made for masters and slaves. I was looking at a book that I have in my library this week, since I knew we were going to be discussing this. The title is that, the, that, that Christ submits to the church. As Christ submits to the church, that that is somehow found in these verses, and that that impacts how we ought to understand the husband-wife dynamic as well. The reality is that what the text says is the church submits to Christ, not vice versa. Now, the argument that is presented for uh, 
uh, this, when it is told, well, you don't find the words that, the, that Christ submits to the church in this text, nor do you find it elsewhere in the New Testament, it's kind of dismissed as, well, that's just, that's simplistic. Just because I, I can't find that phrase doesn't mean it's not true. But the reality is we have to operate based on what the text actually says. And here we see that what Christ did in the cross, how he loved the church and gave himself up for her, has very real, tangible application for the marriage relationship. And we're going to see that this week. We'll also see it next week as we wrap up chapter 5 next Sunday morning, Lord willing. But in the meantime, we have set here before us the relationship of, okay, Paul just said that the Spirit-filled life manifests in one way by this submitting to one another. Well, how does that show up in the family? How does that show up in the marriage relationship? And essentially, it looks like this. Husbands are the head of their family, and in particular, head of the wife. That's what Paul says here in verse 23. And that wives, likewise, and that comes with, by the way, responsibility. And we'll talk about husbands love your wives. And then the wife here, uh, that submission manifests in her relationship to her husband. And again, all this is a glorious reflection of the reality of Christ and His church. And it's when we start trying to mash all this down that we also get into trouble with how does the church relate to Christ. I don't think it's an accident that the same ones who are advocating for that radical mutual submission to the point that they even say, well, Christ submits to His church, are the same ones who are very quickly abandoning the authority of Scripture and its fundamental teachings about Christianity and the Christian life. Now, we climb back into the first century in which Paul is writing this to a church, or rather to several churches in the Lycus River Valley. Ephesus would have been the first stop on the book tour. And if we look at the family, when Paul wrote these words that we find here in this epistle, You had dire and desperate situations within the family, both in the pagan community, the surrounding unbelieving community, but also in the Jewish community. In other words, there was trouble in the family among the Greeks and among the Jews. The pagan family unit was in deep degradation. One writer said you do not find purity, nor love in the pagan family. Even when Jesus walked the planet, among the Jewish people, the the Jewish family was threatened with unholy conduct and unholy standards. You could find rabbinic teaching that advised, don't talk much with women, and then they were also quick to add, not even with one's wife. And again, that's the That is the Jewish understanding. And they were the ones who had the oracles of God entrusted to them. The ancients thought that the two best days of a woman's life were the day when she found someone to marry her and the day that he carried her body to the graveyard. And it's into this context which devalues women and the marriage relationship generally. That you have this clarion call of this higher love, this agape love that is to be found in the family, and also that manifests in a relationship of love and respect. Paul begins uh, with the wives. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. And again, the way that this is written indicates that this is, this is not just a general blanket statement concerning women. And again, that we're destroying some kind of social hierarchy here uh, in order to bring everybody onto this equal plane and, um, uh, and, and how that impacts the marriage relationship. 
No, there is a, a, a fundamental order within the family concerning husbands and wives. And they, have, they are different. Men and women are different. I know that's not very popular these days to say, but that's true. And as a result of those differences, they bring very different things to the marriage relationship and to the family unit at large. And that, by the way, is by design. That's part of the good design of God when it comes to men and women and husbands and wives. That is what we need to champion in the midst of a culture and a society which is very rapidly throwing out all of this. And so wives here submit to your own husbands. Right? Here is where this here this is what submission looks like in the marriage relationship. Wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now it is true that the word here for submit is supplied in our English translations. It doesn't appear in the original language. It's supplied because that is the previous uh, statement made in verse 21. The idea in verse 21 is carried over into verse 22. And so submit to one another. What does that look like in the marriage relationship? Wives, submit to your own husbands. You have your own husband. You submit to him. Again, this is the practical manifestation of the spirit-filled life for the Christian wife. And she is to submit to her own husband as to the Lord. That in the same way that she has submitted herself to the Lord, so also she submits herself to her husband. Now, submission, again, unfortunately, is a, uh, it's gotten a bad rap uh, among people, but it's not a dirty word. It's a good thing. In fact, it is a divine calling placed upon a wife. I like John Piper's definition from his book, This Momentary Marriage. He says, submission is the divine calling of a wife to honor and affirm her husband's leadership and help carry it through according to her gifts. That the, it rec, this recognizes that the wife, she has certain gifts and abilities that have been given to her providentially by God and also as a result of becoming a Christian. And according to those gifts, she honors and affirms and helps her husband carry through his leadership responsibility in the home. That's a beautiful thing. And this is how, again, the gospel impacts the marriage relationship. Now, Unfortunately, we are fallen people, and even though we become Christians, we still battle against the flesh and against sin and against the world. And sometimes that has impact upon uh, our relationship in the marriage. Adam Clark, in his commentary, says, The husband should not be a tyrant, nor the wife a governor. The wife should not be the governor. And when the wife elevates herself to assume what is not hers, we end up with either a two-headed monstrosity where the husband is the head but also the wife is the head, or we have the wrong head and everything becomes upside down where you have a mother-led where the mother is the head of the marriage relationship and the father the husband ends up being very passive uh, in that relationship. Many Christian marriages, as a result, can end up looking like the unwise uh, people in the world. And it can also lead to shipwreck of the marriage, uh, or at least it wreaks havoc on the relationship so that it's uh, kind of this last one out to the graveyard, turn off the lights and, and all that. Marriage ought to be more than just white-knuckling our way through this life so that you know, we've got to stay together for whatever reason. The marriage relationship is intended to give life. It's supposed to be part of the Spirit-filled life for the Christians. And so as a result, wives submit to your own husbands. Again, this recognizes that the wife has a divine calling upon her life, and that's a good calling from God but then also the husband has his calling. For, and the for here is explanatory, for the husband is the head of the wife. You see, the wife submits to her husband for he is her head. 
Again, there are those who want to redefine not just the word submission, but also redefine the word head here. However, contextually, headship, and again, I'm, I'm leaning upon John Piper in his book, This Momentary Marriage, good little thin book, uh, very easy to read. Uh, there he defines headship as the divine calling of a husband to take primary responsibility for Christ-like servant leadership, protection, and provision in the home. This is, again, a divine calling upon the husband. And just as was mentioned earlier, it does not mean that the husband is to be a tyrant. That would be an abuse of power. That would be behavior that is indicative of the curse. Going all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where the wife's desire will be to rule her husband, but instead he is going to rule her, and it's a harsh, autocratic, authoritarian type rule. Headship, the divine calling here, is to take primary responsibility. Primary, recognizing that the wife also is to be Christ-like, but in, in this case, Christ-like servant leadership, protection and provision. Now, all of the, the protection, the provision is going to be spelled out as we get deeper into the end of chapter 5. Christ nourishes his bride, and Christ cherishes his bride, verse 29. And so we'll, we'll impact the protection and the provision. But in the meantime, as we kind of get the, the lay of the land here, we see that the husband has this leadership role. And it's not to, to boss his wife around or to use his position as some kind of privilege. Jesus helped to redefine what his kind of servant leadership ought to look like. What does it sound like? Come with me to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10 Verses 35 to 45 is the account where James and John, they come to Jesus and they want to sit at Jesus' right hand and at his left hand. And they have to have a conversation about, well, do you really know what you're asking? Can you drink the cup? Can you be baptized with the baptism I'm going to be baptized with? And they say, oh, yeah, we're able to drink it. And um, Jesus, again, sets the record straight. This led to the other ten apostles being indignant or angry at the request of James and John. Who do you guys think you are that you can have the right hand and left hand? Don't you know I can sit there too? And we can only imagine what that conversation sounded like. So Jesus has to call time out, team huddle, get together. And in verse 42, Mark 10, verse 42, Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And, and in fact, the force of that word is there must be your slave. And whoever would be first among you must be a slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here is, again, Christ-like servant leadership. This is the kind of leadership that the husband is to exercise. How do we know? Paul connects it to Christ and what he did for his bride. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now, what is the supreme demonstration of Christ as the Savior? The cross. And in fact, Paul connects it to the cross in verse 25. Christ loved the church and gave Himself up for her. And the language there of giving Himself up, that is the language of substitutionary sacrifice on the cross. Christ in our place for our sin. And so, a priority is placed on the husband. But contrary to what we heard from the other ancient societies, both Greek and Jew, the priority here is for the benefit of the wife. 
that the husband is to model self-sacrificial, self-denial on behalf of first his bride, but then also for the family. We're going to see that it's the fathers who take primary, not sole, responsibility in how they lead their family, their children. It's for the benefit of the family. Not for his own self-serving purposes. And again, it's because of Christ. Even as Christ is the head of the church. Christ's relationship to the church is the model for headship. And we see, we've already seen his model for servant leadership modeled after him. Over in Mark 10, verses 43 through 45. And so, we see here, again, how the gospel impacts husbands, impacts wives, impacts the marriage relationship as a whole. And unfortunately, I think one of the, one of the significant reasons why the world is messed up in the home and, and elsewhere is because it doesn't know Christ. And so long as a man or a woman remains disconnected from Christ, and refuses to submit their lives to Him, they are always going to be one down in the home, on the job, and everywhere else. When the foundational relationship with Christ is missing, every other relationship that you have is going to suffer. Whether we want to talk about husband and wife, parent-child, employer-employee, what have you. Only Christ can, first of all, bring wholeness to us individually and then wholeness to our relationships with others. Without Christ, we are always going to be playing one down. We're always going to be coming up short. And because of that, chaos often ensues. Paul here identifies the church as the body of Christ. This is something that we saw many, many moons ago back in chapter 1 of Ephesians. Um, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, uh, especially verse 23, the church is his body, is Christ's body. We also see the beauty of this because the church, which is his body, is the fullness of him who fills all in all. That the filler is full when he has all of his redeemed with him. Uh, the one who lacks nothing, needs nothing, is full in himself, is filled, and the church is his fullness uh, when his redeemed are brought to him. That's, again, a very fascinating concept there, but um, it is his body, and Christ is himself its Savior. And again, that's related to the cross. He gave himself up for his church on the cross. Now, of course, the, the, the main emphasis here is on the husband as head of the wife. Is there a sense in which Christ, uh, the, the, excuse me, in which the husband is the wife's savior? Well, no and yes. No in the sense that Christ is the savior of husband and wife, right? Uh, he's the savior of men and women. However, as the husband fulfills his role as head in, uh, through his self-denial and as protector and provider, as he fulfills his role as Christ-like leadership, well, I suppose in one sense it could be that he is working to save his family. I guess it would be akin to what Noah does when he builds his ark in order to save eight souls alive including himself, that the husband is essentially building his ark as he loves his wife and as he leads his children and leads his family in that way. And so he, with them, are saved through Christ. Perhaps uh, that is one way of looking at it. Now, verse 24, as the church submits to Christ, you see, the church is composed of those who have submitted themselves to Christ who have 
voluntarily, and that's part of this idea, is the voluntary aspect of this, voluntarily acknowledge the lordship of Christ, who honor and affirm the leadership of Christ, and help to see Christ carry through His leadership in this world, according to the gifts and calling that we have, that's the model here for wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Um, in everything. I guess we need to have a conversation about that, right? Uh, in everything. Everything here means all things that are lawful and all things that are acceptable to God. Anything criminal, anything against God's will, should be avoided. And of course, a husband who is demonstrating Christ-like servant leadership would never ask his wife to engage in a criminal enterprise or to do those things that are displeasing to the Lord. Now, what happens, though, when a wife is married to an unbeliever? Well, for that, you need the instruction given by Peter over in 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, very quickly, while there are those who want to advocate for a redefinition of submission and headship, based on Ephesians chapter 5, they are eerily silent when it comes to parallel passages like Colossians chapter 3, Titus chapter 2, and 1 Peter chapter 3. I find that very, uh, well, troubling to their interpretation of Scripture. But here in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1, and you dig back into the context, it starts in, in chapter 2, that there is a kind of conduct that Christians are to engage in such that unbelievers can see it, can identify that they're Christians, and a couple things happen. Number one, um, verse 12 of chapter 2, they glorify God on the day of visitation. Or, um, in verse 15, that by doing good, the unbeliever is actually silenced because their foolish talk is put to shame. Right? So, this is the context for what Peter's going to say here in chapter 3. What kind of conduct is becoming of a Christian? We can say it this way. Peter is, saying, is talking about the same thing that Paul is, the normal Christian life. And what does it look like for the wife? Chapter 3, verse 1, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, what, what, kind of, what kind of husband would that be? That would be an unbelieving husband. He doesn't obey the Word. He doesn't obey the Word of God. He has not submitted his life to Christ. So that even if some do not obey the Word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Just because you have an unbelieving husband does not mean that the Word of God does not still have bearing upon your life as a wife. Similarly, husbands, just because you may have an unbelieving wife does not mean that you are not under the Word of God concerning how you are, conduct, how you are to conduct yourself with your wife. You still owe your unbelieving spouse what Christ calls you to in these texts, in other words, which means the wife is still to subject herself or be in submission to her own husband, and husbands are to uh, love their wife in a, a self-sacrificial, self-denying way. And so, in everything, again, all things lawful, all things acceptable to God, uh, when the will of the unbelieving husband or the unbelieving wife comes in conflict with the Word of God, I believe the biblical response is we must obey God rather than humans. Now, the tragedy of tragedies is when God's Word is twisted in order to justify cruel or abusive behavior. And yes, that is an unfortunate reality even for some Christian men and women. 
Some men read, wives submit, husband is the head, and they disconnect it from its context. Its context is spirit-filled life. Its context is Christ-like servant leadership. But when it is disconnected from its context, it produces unhealthy and ungodly circumstances within the marriage and within the family. And then uh, it's really bad when little Jimmy sees what daddy is doing to mommy. And then a cycle is perpetuated as Jimmy grows up and does what he saw in the home. And again, that Christians are not exempt from this. It happens even within the church. And it's not just physical abuse. It can be emotional abuse, psychological abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. These are all very damaging things. And the Word of God speaks to our lives and says, Brethren, these things ought not to be so. This kind of behavior, whether it's coming from the husband or the wife, there are some wives who uh, will be physically abusive, verbally abusive, uh, psychologically abusive to their husbands. This kind of behavior has no place in the Christian marriage. Verse 33 is going to conclude all this for us next week, but we might as well take a peek at it now. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Love and respect. And uh, Dr. Egerix has made a fortune on uh, this with his book, Love and Respect. And he's got a whole series of love and respect in the family, with the kids and all that. Um, love and respect. This is, again, uh, the calling of God upon husbands and upon wives. Let's wrap up verse 25 here. Husbands, love your wives. What kind of love are we talking about here? It's, it's the word that we're familiar with. If you've uh, been in the church for a while, if you've been a Christian for a while, you recognize the term agape. That's the Greek term for it here. Uh, agape. It's not, um, there, there were, in fact, C.S. Lewis wrote a book, the, the, the Four Loves, and he talks about the, the four different words that they had in the original language for love. And it is not eros, which is the sexual love, and it's not uh, storgeo, which is the familial love, and it's not phileo, which is the friendship love, although I think... Those three things ought to be present in the marriage relationship. It's not to the exclusion of those, but the word that is utilized here is the selfless, self-denying, self-sacrificing type of love that shows up again and again in the New Testament. It is connected to the kind of love, as we see here, that Christ has for His church, where He lays down His life. For his church. He gave himself up for her, uh, again, leading to the cross. That the husband must live the cross shaped life. That his leadership as head of the house must be shaped by Christ and the cross. And so, when husbands love their wives as they ought, guess what that means for the wife? Typically, it means it's easy for her to honor and affirm his leadership in the home. It's easier for her to do her job in carrying out, uh, helping him carry out his leadership according to her gifts that God and Christ have given her by the Spirit. And so, again, all this comes back to the gospel. Christ gave himself up for the church according to the love. And let me just say this. Again, this is the gospel here. Christ loves His church. He loves you, my brothers and sisters. He loves us with an incredible love. And He came from heaven into this world to be born of the virgin, which was only the beginning of His humiliation. And then He lives a perfect, sinless life that you and I, we, 
we could never live. We didn't, we didn't live. We know we, could, we didn't. And he endured all the humiliation that went along with. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. And all the humiliation of not being believed upon by even his own family members. And he endures the humiliation of the kangaroo court. That although they could find nothing to pin on him, they still condemned him to death. Both the Jewish authorities and the Roman authorities. And he endured the humiliation of being beaten about the head, having having the, the soldiers mock him, having the religious leaders mock him, having the people cry out, crucify him, crucify him, being scourged by the Romans, all this leading to having the nails, great big railroad spikes driven into his flesh and his hands and his feet, the crown of thorns placed upon his head, all this. Why does he do this unto death, even death on a cross, the most torturous method of death ever devised by the fallen mind of humans? Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. We know elsewhere he despised the shame for the joy that was set before him. What kind of joy? The kind of joy that Christ as the groom has for his bride, the church. And he was redeeming her and Verse 26, sanctifying her and cleansing her by the washing of water with the Word. Knowing that He was paying the price for His bride. And He did it gladly. Of course, we know. While He dies on the cross and is buried in the tomb, He does not stay buried. Three days later, the tomb is found open, empty. The grave clothes are lying there. And He has been raised from the dead. He's seen by dozens, hundreds of witnesses. And then is ascended back to the Father's right hand where he lives and rules forevermore and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. This is our Christ. And why did he do that? Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Why did he go to the cross? Why did he endure all this? Christ loved the church. And by the way, although this is written in the past tense, don't for a moment think that, well, he loved us in the past. He doesn't love us now. That's a ridiculous thought. He still loves us. I have loved you with an everlasting love. So says our God. He gave himself up for her. That's the sacrifice of Christ. And now, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms is ours, including those heavenly blessings that we need to be the husbands and the wives that God, that Christ, that the Holy Spirit is calling us to be. So much more to say. We'll have to pick this up next week. Let's commit this to prayer. It is a a high and a holy calling, Father, that you place before us as both husbands and wives. And first and foremost, Father, if there are those who are within the sound of my voice who have been engaged in ungodly, wicked, sinful behavior toward their spouse, I pray that you convict them by the Holy Spirit to the point that they are absolutely broken before your holy throne so that they would abandon such low, sinful, ungodly behavior in the marriage relationship. Father, break their spirit. Father, for my brothers and sisters who love one another as as husbands and wives do, who seek to honor one another with the love and the respect I pray that you would fan into flame so that they do so more and more and and experience new heights of joy in their marriage relationship. And And indeed, Father, they image Christ and His church in their marriage. 
And we ultimately give you thanks for Christ who has sent the Holy Spirit so that we can live the Spirit-filled life as husbands and wives. And He is the one who gave Himself up for us and who makes it possible for us to address you as Father. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.